we can uh, we can uh, let me see some how start uh, first of all saying hello to 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 everybody good morning good afternoon good evening wherever you are uh, we are uh, you know and mauro and we are uh, uh, both in europe myself in italy near milano and uh, and tino is in belgium and uh, we have already not yet started, but we have already a question uh, whether we will get they will get the slides of the training. Yes, uh, I will give them. I will give all uh, some uh, some few instruction. But the question, the answer is yes. You will get it. Uh, so let me check if I'm able to to control the screen now before to to real start. Uh, I've answered the question already, Maru. I typed it, then you can maybe re repeat the question again. Okay. Yes, yes, yes. I, I will. It was anyway a point uh, that I was uh, I was planning to touch. Uh, sorry, I'm trying to to get the real control because I'm not able to move the page at the okay. moment before to 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 start. Uh, okay, it looks I like. Hear I was hearing a beep, so it looks like you were trying to control the screen. Can you do now forward and a backward of the screen? It is not moving. I can do it also here, Maro. Maybe just say next slide. Because I, I got a waiting. Yes. To control. Yeah, let's do like that. Otherwise, we will not. Uh, okay. we, okay. we are losing too much time. Good. So again, uh, thank you very much for uh, for being with us. Here we have the another a new webinar and GMI since uh, beginning of uh, March, uh, April, uh, uh, beginning of March, uh, we are conducting a several kind of uh, webinar free of charge available to, to, to everybody on several topics, uh, functional safety, one of the main uh, intrinsic safety, another uh, topic uh, uh, or application in general uh, in automation and in safety and intrinsic safety environment. Today we have a seminar concerning uh, functional safety. That's why we have here Tino van de Capel um, and myself. I am going just to introduce uh, this, uh, this webinar and then I will leave the speech to, uh, to Tino for the subject of today, which is uh, um, priori news versus uh, uh, proven news, which seems to be two identical or very similar uh, arguments, uh, topic. Uh, uh, on the other hand, there are differences, and, and Tino will explain us uh, very well. So let's go ahead. Uh, just a few, um, yeah, before, before to, to, to start with the topic, uh, I would like to introduce uh, to get some time to introduce the company, GMI. Uh, on the other hand, I would like also to give some general information about the webinar. Uh, somebody was asking whether uh, are you going to receive the copy of the presentation? The answer is yes. You will all receive a PDF with, uh, with all the slides. Uh, you will also have the chance to view, review this, uh, this webinar as well as uh, all the other webinar we, we, con we have conducted and we will conduct in the future, assessing to uh, GMI YouTube channel because we are recording this webinar as well as all the other, and you will have the chance to, to review that. Um, you will also receive a copy of a certificate uh, if, if your participation exceeds the 75% of, uh, of the time. Um, so let's let's go ahead uh, with the, with the company presentation. Very very short uh, to leave the space to, to to the topic of today. So GMI is a uh, um, Italian company. We are based in uh, near Milano, near Monza, and uh, what we do we. We do engineer and we manufacture uh, a wide range of uh, um, field device. 
Uh, we cover uh, different aspects of safety, mainly intrinsic safety and functional safety. That's why all our products are either intrinsic safety certified or uh, certified uh, SEAL 3, SEAL 2 certified uh, for functional safety. We find, you find uh, GMI product in several packaging in the automation world, in the DCS, CSD, fire and gas, EMS, HIPS, and so on and so on in different uh, environment, in different in sectors like oil and gas, chemical, petrochemical, and lately also in the food and, uh, and uh, in the food industry, as well in the uh, pharmaceutical industry. Uh, we are Italian, however, and we have uh, our uh, production site. Uh, we produce everything 100% here in Italy. On the other hand, we are present in the world. We have uh, um, 10 GMI offices uh, located worldwide. Wherever we do not have an office, uh, a GMI office, we have a partner there, whether it is uh, uh, an agent or a distributor. Uh, and uh, just to give you some number, we have, of course, a thousand of installation. Being worldwide, uh, we are covered by uh, almost all certification required to be used outside uh, Italy, of course. Uh, um, and then just to give you some numbers, we have thousands of installation as well. Just we are talking about uh, uh, functional safety. Um, we, are, we have also a dedicated uh, office uh, uh, for training and uh, consultancies. And just to give you an impression, okay, before 2020, we were able to provide uh, up to 20 trainings uh, uh, worldwide uh, on topics like uh, functional safety and cybersecurity. We will, I'm not going to, 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 to talk too much in details about this because we, were, we have a slide and we want to inform you which kind of training and support we can provide you uh, in, this, uh, in this environment. So uh, we say the safety, and of course, the safety means uh, protection of human life, uh, protection of the of environment, the protection of assets of a company. Uh, that's why quality it is uh, one of the most important things. And that's why everything produced here in GMI is then 100% tested, and everything can be traced uh, uh, once it is produced, once it, once it is in the field any issue uh, which is associated to a product, uh, it can be traced down up to the which, tank, uh, which kind of raw material was used, which batch, and so on and so on. So quality is one of the most important topics and the things that we, we, we have in mind in our, in our production stage. Uh, so we are so sure about the quality of our product that we also release a five years warranty, um, five, five years warranty uh, for our product as a standard uh, solution. So I say that we uh, being installed worldwide, we need to be certified to be installed worldwide. So. Uh, any customer, either it is an end user, uh, an APC contractor, a system integrator, would find uh, a solution uh, uh, suitable for the project uh, they you are going to, to, to provide. Uh, so you, you, you are fully covered by uh, the local certification. And of course, uh, we have uh, also certificates uh, of our company, like uh, uh, stating the capability to to engineer and produce uh, seal tree uh, equipment. Uh, we are, of course, certified to, 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 to produce uh, ATEX equipment and so on and so on. So we can go ahead, Tino, uh, to the next uh, slide. Here it is just an overview, a summary of, uh, of our product. So we have, uh, shortly, uh, we have uh, ES barrier, of course. We have safety relays when we deal and we talk about functional safety. We have isolators, we have power supply systems, and uh, we have also multiplexer. Multiplexer means uh, a collector of uh, low level signals like temperature, uh, which can be done up to zone one. 
and then brought to the uh, control room uh, uh, over Modbus, for example, uh, uh, and we have different kinds of solutions. Then, of course, uh, we have Art Multiplexer as well. And uh, since we deal with a lot of uh, uh, PLC manufacturer or DCS manufacturer, we have several uh, dedicated uh, tailored uh, termination board to be connected uh, straight away to the main uh, DCS and PLC and safety system available on the market. And finally, we have some uh, we have suit protector solution, and all these uh, application or all these uh, product I mentioned, either they are uh, seal certified or uh, intrinsic safe certified, or both of them. That's our um, one of our one of the characteristic of our product. And finally, the last bullet is not a product; it is uh, uh, showing. Uh, our commitment uh, uh, to provide uh, uh, and to share our knowledge uh, to the market. So we have a department, dedicated department uh, for consultancies and training. And Tino is, for example, our functional safety director. And through Tino, uh, his knowledge and his team, we are available and ready to provide the training courses on functional safety, training courses on, on, on cyber security, which is quite new uh, in, uh, in, in GMI as a proposal. And we have also chance uh, to provide uh, um, in pre um, training course on ICEX uh, topics. Uh, in, and in all cases, uh, uh, we are talking about uh, courses, uh, but we are talking about uh, also certification program, but we will have chance later on to, to touch this, this shortly this point. This is just a, a list, a short list of uh, the customer that we, we reach. Uh, of course, we have different kind of customer like system vendors, which we deal directly. We have EPC contractor, which we support uh, uh, with our solution, OEM, uh, and of course, uh, and of course, uh, end user. This is just a short list, and I do not want, of course, uh, to enter too much in details. As mentioned, uh, uh, you will receive the copy of this certificate and I, uh, of this presentation. Sorry, and I want just to mention the very last point uh, before to give the speech uh, and to enter into the uh, details uh, of today. Um, that you have a box, somebody of you already used that, uh, it is for question and answer. So while Tino will, uh, will do the presentation, I will monitor that. Uh, and uh, if you have any question, use the question and answer box. Uh, and then uh, that's all. Uh, Tino? Hey. I... All right, oh. thank you, Maru. Thank you for GMI also to give us another opportunity to make another webinar. Maro was saying we're doing this since March of April, but he didn't say it's March of April from last year. So we are now doing this for over a year. We started with this because of the COVID-19 situation that uh, we had to change some of our activities. So we dedicated uh, a few hours a week to webinars and that is what GMI has been doing. Topic for today, proven in use versus prior use. It may sound the same, but there are quite some differences. They have some different meanings, also different nature from where they have to come. One is for the manufacturers of equipment, that's the proven in use. The prior use is for the end users, for the operating companies. Very quick introduction, how it all started. It started in 1998, 1997, 1998 was the first release of the 65008 standard, which was the IEC standard dedicated for the manufacturers of electrical equipment, equipment with some electronic components on it, or equipment that you could program. We used to call this the EEPES, stands for Electrical, Electronical, Programmable, Electronical Safety Related Systems. And the first edition had no proven in use mentioning in there. That was not at all a uh, topic. It was all based on something which we call now in the edition two, we call this the road one eight. That means it's a theoretical approach of an investigation slash expert judgment that you're looking into a equipment 
to see, as an example, with an FMEA, with a further modern effect analysis on how reliable that equipment could be. The IEC 61511 first edition came out in 2003 slash 2004, and they introduced a term called prior use. And the word prior use means you use it before. So the prior use, it was described in a certain way that was almost sounding as proven in use, but the definition was clearly stated as prior use. And this will be later on recognized now in addition to as road two H. In 2010, the second edition came out of the 61508. And just for, for your information, edition three is about to be announced to come out. So we are still today in edition two, but there's a new edition three coming up from the IEC 61508. Currently today, we have the current edition, the second edition, which was released in April, 2010, and they, in, introduced this uh, proven in use as road to aids. So you may have seen on some of your documentation, your data sheets or your certification that the vendors will give you on their equipment that they will have either road one aids defined or road two aids. And there are quite some differences. Road one aids means that you will have a safe fellow fraction and a hardware fault tolerance, which will be defined in a certain, uh, let's say, definition. Whereas road 2 h it is more the expert judgment based on data they collected on the proven in use on similar uh, application in similar environment. That's all needs to be proved. But I got some more details coming up in the webinar for that. And the latest edition, which was 2016 slash 2017, because there were some uh, problems with the release of edition two, they call this now road 2 h and either you can go prior use for your table six over minimum architectural constraints, or you can call it proven in use. And again, in my slides later on, I will have some more de details. So purely on terms of definition, proven in use is a definition that did not exist in the edition 01 in 1998. It was only introduced as a definition in April 2010. We don't have to read this, but basically it is saying that you need to demonstrate based on some, let's say, feedback data that the configuration of an element, that the dangerous or the systematic false is low enough so that every safety function that is using that element can achieve the safety integrity level it was designed for. The 61511 is calling it prior use. But the 61511, that's a dedicated standard for the application of the process industry. And as Mauro was mentioning before, the process industry has in 2016, edition two, has two new applications. It's the food and beverage, and it's the pharmaceutical. But the classical original dedication of the application is the oil and gas, chemicals and petrochemicals. And the prior use in 2003, when it was introduced in the edition one, was giving it a reference, was giving as proven in use in the first edition. When a documented assessment has shown that there is appropriate evidence based on the previous use of the component, that that component is suitable for use in an SIS or a safety instrumented system. Now we all know by, by experience that the operating companies or end users typically are not collecting the data we would need to demonstrate that you can use this for a safety instrumented system to achieve a certain C level. They may know when it failed and how, and they may say what brand or what type was failing and who has replaced it. But when we ask them for failure analysis, such as what was the root cause of the failure, was it a safe failure or a danger failure? What was the frequency? I can tell you that by experience, by end users, that's very, very hard to find this type of data with them. Edition two. Yeah, edition two is saying the prior use, a documented assessment by a user that a device is suitable for the use in a SIS and can be meet 
the required functional safety or safety integrity, or sorry, and safety integrity requirements based on the previous operating experience in similar operating environments. What I want to highlight here is that it's all about your experience in your environment with your application, with your proof test uh, intervals and proof test coverage experience, and also proof test consistency. So it doesn't matter that maybe your neighbor uh, plant that is maybe from another, uh, let's say, operating company, that they have maybe some good experience with a equipment. It's all about your experience if you are the end user or the operating company listening in here to this webinar. What is, for instance, nonsense is that you will use a, a genetic database from a company or maybe from the website that you somewhere have bought or, or purchased and you claim this as your own data, that is not the purpose of the standard. The whole edition two of both standards 61508 and 61511 has one main target, it's called quality data, quality feedback of failure data. And that is what the uh, road to H, where it is either prior use for the operating companies or end users, or it is proven in use for the manufacturers, it's always the question, where is this quality data evidence coming from? When you are looking into the road, uh, sorry, into the edition two of the 61508, there are two potential solutions. Either you will go for the theoretical approach like we have done in the 1998 in the edition one, which is called the road 1H, which is based on the hardware fault tolerance and on the safe failure fraction. And I am aware, of course, and I'm also fully agree with the, let's say, differences of some, sorry, with the opinions of some of the committees that the safe failure fractions by some man manufacturers was actually, uh, let's say, taking into a certain context that the safe failure fraction has lost the credibility in the market, that some manufacturers were coming with safe failure fractions almost too nice to be true. And therefore, the edition two mentality of the 6511 is saying, why don't we try to get quality data from the end users and from the operating companies based on their experience, because they know how they use or slash abuse the equipment, and they know how they use it in their environment, in their, in, in their installation. So therefore, it's all about the quality feedback data. And that is the second bullet here, that is road to H. And it's based on component reliability data feedback from end users, based on increased confidence levels and hardware fault tolerance for specified safety integrity levels or SIL levels. The hardware safety integrity architecture constraint table, that is actually something which we call in a standard table six. And what they have changed by the edition two in relation to the older edition one. The older edition one had the same table with the same hardware fault tolerance, but they were focusing in the edition one on every equipment in the field will have a safe failure fraction between 60 to 90%. And as I said, out of history, the uh, committee for the 6511 said, actually, we don't like the safe failure fraction uh, because we don't trust it anymore. The, credibility on some of the safe failure fraction on some of the equipment with some manufacturers has been totally insane. So therefore we don't trust that. So we would prefer to use our own data and there is nothing wrong by using your own data providing you can show quality failure feedback data. So we have now three options if it comes to build a safety loop. And the hardware fault tolerance table, HFT, stands for how many danger failures can your loop architecture tolerate and still achieve safety. I give you a simple example. You have, for instance, a uh, pipeline with two fail to close valves. That means you can close either valve A or B. That means the HFT for this solution is one, that when they are both fail close, if I close either valve A or valve B, I can still isolate my flow in my pipeline. That would be called an HFT of one. And this HFT of one is a definition by the standard to say, if you want to achieve a certain SIL level, you have to also prove a minimum HFT. And what they have done now by the um, 
edition two of the 61511, table six has been simplified. And they clearly state, and I got the table somewhere in my slides coming up, for a SIL one, you can uh, you have to prove the minimum HFT of zero. So in other words, you can build it with single devices, single input, single output, or single final elements. For a SIL two, for a low demand mode, you can remain your HFT zero. But if you go for a high demand on SIL two or for a SIL three, that the minimum HFT will be one. So there are three options if you want to build your loops. Method number one, there they still go by the road 1H, which was the original edition one standard um, theoretical approach, which is uh, claiming the safe value fraction and the HFT per subsystem. Method number two is the quality failure feedback data collected by the manufacturers. That is the famous proven in use. And method number three is called the quality failure feedback data from the end users slash operating companies, which is called the prior in use. And it is about method number two and method number three that this webinar is all about. Okay, Maro, I got the first poll question coming yes. up. Yes, yeah, yeah. We are looking to, to, to get some feedback from you. We would like to, to have your opinion in one specific question. I can read the questions for them, Maro, just to help them thinking. So the, the poll question, the, the purpose is just to see what the audience today has of interpretation on this particular topic. So the article constraint as per the IEC 6511, which was uh, between brackets, this table number six, which you haven't seen yet. There's only one answer is the most complete and the most correct answer here in this A, B, C, D. So I'll read the question and the potential answers. So the article constraint table six can use either method one or method two or method three, but only one method per SIF or per safety instrumented function. That is answer A. Answer B is can use method two and method three, both based on row two H mixed per SIF. Answer C, can use only road 1H when claiming prior use for the IC 6511. And the last answer is D, can mix per SIF method one, method two, or method three per safety as minute function, all as applicable. That is the choices you can make. I would say, uh, please click on the potential answer. So we see at least some participation or some interaction. It's also meaning that you're not asleep yet. That's also <laughs> for us. I was just checking my, my coffee model, but my coffee is empty, so. So don't be shy. Just, we wait just a few seconds again. Please click as, a, as a, you know, was, was mentioning. Okay. You clicks again and then we we move on yes okay so we yeah, will stop get it we stop it and i share the i share the result of this uh, poll the majority here has chosen for answer a can use either method one or two or three but only one method per safety element function which is unfortunately not the correct answer because this is certainly not correct. I wish it could be true because this would be a great job for any function safety assessment job that we would have to do. That uh, SIF would be only using a method and only one method uh, in totality, which is totally, well, that is wishful thinking, I would say to be polite. Um, the second answer can use method two or three, both based on road 1H. Well, that's not correct because method two and three, that is road 2H, which is prior or proven use. Can only use road 1H when claiming prior use, that's totally wrong. And the last answer can mix per SIF method one, two, three, per SIF all as applicable. That is a fact of life. Every assessment that we have been doing for the last, I don't know how many years we are doing assessments on jobs is always mixing those. As a classical example, your safety PLC potentially will always be road 1H. 
your smart and hard sensors may be a mix already. Maybe a mix of partially road one eight, road two eight. But think about your finer elements. When it comes to your finer elements, means your uh, uh, your solenoids, your actuators, your uh, valve itself. Well, that is where it become a mix. There you may have potentially a smart positioner on road one eight. You may have an actuator, maybe road one eight, maybe road two eight, and you may have a ball valve, a gate valve, or a butterfly valve with nothing. And then you will try to claim a silk class for that. So the question is, how will you do that? Okay, Maro, let's stop sharing this. Let me continue. Uh, so share the results. So that was the share the results. I don't know why it was not shared before. Stop sharing. Okay, it was me doing a wrong thing. Sorry, Maro. Okay, continue. That's the summary for this method one, two, and three. So focus here on the right hand side on the bottom corner here on this table, that is table number six. And table number six is as per sill level, you have a minimum HFT. And this is the method number three, that is the preference for the addition to of the 61511, which is called road to H, which is the prior use. But the prior use has some conditions that some people do not know. But the prior use, it's all about the end user feedback. And the IEC standard, which was released 2016, is still referring here to report four of the ISA 84, which I can tell you now, that's the 2015 release. There is a new release about to come out. It's not being um, released yet for the simple reason that the I ISA 84 has now the ISA 650.11 and report number four is under review. I actually received yesterday evening a uh, email. There is a, um, a Zoom meeting. I think it's this week or next week to discuss the edition two for the report number four. So there will be a new edition coming out, which will have 2021. The second reference that the standard is giving in the IEC standard is to the Namur NE130. And uh, for those people who do not know what Namur is, Namur is the, uh, call it the uh, end user uh, committee for the chemical uh, end users, which has a, uh, a range of guidance of application notes or guidelines. And that is the NE130, talking about the collection for collecting your fair data of your safety instrument systems in your SIS. Second condition is that you need to have a full variable language or limited variable language equipment it needs to have a minimum diagnostic coverage of higher than 60%, equal or higher than 60%. Your data confidence, the ability feedback of your fair data must be more or equal to 70, minimum 70%, and performance must be proven of evidence similar operating environments. When the operating companies end users have no of those conditions that they can prove. Then the alternative is you ask the manufacturers for the proven in use data. And some of them can prove some data. That's the manufacturer feedback based on those two standards. Evaluation expert judgment must be made. And if that is not available, that means you cannot use this table six here on the right corner. The left bottom corner is still available, which is called the uh, table two and three, which is type A or type B of the equipment based on road 1H, which is based on an investigation, FMEA, SFF has been defined, the systematic capability has been defined, the definition of type A, type B per device subsystem has also been defined. And of course, as everyone should know, as uh, the edition two 2010 was out, a safety manual is a mandatory requirement per subsystem. And of course, the manufacturer will give you the probability to fail danger upon demand or the PFD per subsystem estimated based on the equipment that you will use. So based here on that table then and the level of seal you want to achieve, the HFT is defined with the leading indicator. The leading indicator is here the safe failure fraction. The leading indicator on method two and three is the type of seal level. And based the higher the sill, the more HFT. 
the higher the safe failure fraction, the lower the HFT for the higher C level. That is how you read those tables. That's table six. So however conditions apply, you are advised by the standard to collect your data based on report four, which I just told you is under review and will be released soon in a new edition. And that's here the Namur 130. That's the prior use collecting of data of your devices. Prior use, again, if some operating company is listening here into this webinar, it's all about your data. Question is, how will you prove the collection of your data? How can you demonstrate how consistent your safety instrument and functions have been tested? In other words, how consistent your proof test coverage and your proof test intervals were on your SIF. How can you prove your environment conditions of the data that you have collected? Give an example. You may have an operating company that has uh, different plans around the world and different continents, but maybe there they have different conditions of the environment. I have, for instance, a uh, operating company in mind that has an installation, a large installation in the Middle East. And they have also a large installation somewhere in the north of Europe. But I can tell you that the weather conditions along are totally different on the North Sea, where it is an offshore business, where they have maybe the same operating company with a plant somewhere in the Middle East, where the conditions there for the offshore are totally different. And those are items that need to be very clearly collected and specified in your evidence levels. We have here the demonstration of the diagnostic coverage must be minimum 60%. That's an easy one because all the equipment with diagnostic coverage inside most likely will have far more than 60%. The manufacturer's quality and management configuration, I could say that's most likely more formality. Think about when it comes to your uh, evidence of all your smart and hard transmitters. Have all those devices the same firmware conditions? Have they been all been used in the same fashion? That's something that needs to be considered. And then we have a special conditions can be applied to actually reduce the HFT if you can prove some certain conditions based on standard definitions. For the proof in use, it's about the manufacturers. How do they collect the data? And Often it is a fact that the manufacturers do not receive the necessary data. I'll give you a very classical example. If your equipment is out of warranty, you may not send back the equipment back to the manufacturer, but simply buy a new one and install a new one in your installation. So the manufacturer may not receive the data that would be needed to get some good quality data. I'm pretty sure if it is about a large installation and there is uh, one vendor that has some serious, let's say, quality problems on some of the equipment and the quality, sorry, the equipment is still in warranty, I'm pretty sure it will be sent back free of charge to the manufacturer to be investigated and they will have to come in and correct it. But if you have some equipment which is a, a certain price for you, it costs you more to send it back to the manufacturer than buy a new one. I'm also aware that the manufacturers may never receive that data that they would need to analyze it. So what is proven in use? It's ABC, it's and, 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 based on field feedback for element similar application and based on data collected on quality references. Those are two reference. Uh, one is the IEC standard, the other one is an ISO. And then it has to be evaluated based on the amount of field feedback and the expertise of an expert judgment and where needed, additional tests or specific tests have been launched on that equipment. So those are all the data that the proven in use needs to be proven, enabled to have a reliability data that we could actually analyze and say, take it for granted that we can make a judgment on it. We still need some failure data on frequencies for that, because that is what you will need if you want to make your SIL verification for that equipment. And for any type B, your diagnostic coverage is, must be more than 60%. Okay, Mara, we have one more poll. That is the poll for the 61508 edition two. 
the manufacturers of device system certificate and test reports. And the question is as follows. As per the 650-08-2010, can be based on either road 1H or road 2H, but only one road selection per device and or system is allowed. Number two or number B is, or type, sorry, answer B is, can be based only as per road 1H, as per safe value fraction and or hardware fault tolerance definition can be based that C on only as per road to H with feather feedback records and D can be based either on road 1H or road 2H individually or mixed. So think about if you buy an equipment from a manufacturer, can be either based on road 1H or road 2H with only one per selection per subsystem or only road 1H or only road 2H that's C and D or D and so D is can be based on a mix of road 1H or road 2H individually or mix on the subsystem itself. Okay, Maro, let the votes come in. Okay, I realized that my audio was deactivated. So let's wait a few clicks again. Okay. And then I stop the poll. Okay, let me stop the poll now and uh, let me show the result. Can you see the result? Yes, you know? okay. they are shared. Okay. Well, here the good, the good news is in the second poll is that the majority here has picked the correct answer because the answer number one can be based on either road 1H or road 2H, but only one road selection per device and or system. Actually, this was the opinion in the beginning of when the standards were released. And that's still when I'm teaching the training courses for the competency reviews, that still, let's say the majority of the people have always the impression that only one road 1H or road 2H per system could be used. I can tell you that this is no longer true since we have many manufacturers now today that will mix on their certification. They will claim on the initial definition of the certification, they will claim road to H, but you will see that the additional investigation on the equipment is a mix of road 1H, meaning FMEA, CFLF fraction, et cetera, on maybe the hardware. I'll give you a typical example. I have in mind, for instance, a smart transmitter manufacturer, where if you look on the certification, certification will clearly claim for road to H. And they claim on road to H, that means that manufacturer has collected some field feedback from in the field. And based on the expert judgment, they may have judged on what type of cell level it can be used for. But then if you read the report or the certification, um, you can also uh, see that they identify the safe value fraction. And the safe value fraction cannot be collected with any road to H collecting of data. That means they also have launched additionally an FMEA on the hardware of the PCB, the printed circuit board of that transmitter. And they have most likely used the road 2 h based on field feedback to demonstrate the systematic capability or the SC on the level of uh, software development, firmware development of their equipment. That's most likely how they will combine their certification with this partially row 2H and partially row 1H. So answer D is here the most correct and the most complete answer, as you will see that many of your certification may have this identification of a row 2H, including also the safe value fraction. So what is the row 1H? That's the edition one, which still remains edition two, the valid road 1H definition, which is the leading indicator, as I called it, is your safe value fraction. The higher the SFF, the higher the SIL level. You see here in this second column, you see here HFT zero. That means with a single device, I can go up to SIL three with a minimum SFF or safe value fraction, which is the quantity of the danger undetected failures ratio hidden away in your equipment. 
That means when you have a safe LF fraction of 90%, that means that the ratio of the danger undetected failures in that equipment is 10% is danger undetected. Well, that is your SFF here of 90%. If you would have an SFF of minimum 90%, you can use this single device for a seal tree. SFF, as I just told you, is the um, ratio of the danger undetected failures, or it is the amount of diagnostic coverage in your equipment. So it is, if applicable, diagnostic coverage. It's, uh, that is the first thing that they will look at is the safe LF fraction. For the method number one, the second, or sorry, the third bullet here is also required is the systematic safety integrity. We call this the safety capability. That's the SC. That's you have seen that already on your certification will be claimed as SC1. A very simple trick, which I like to teach in my training courses, is that to keep it simple here, the minimum, sorry, the maximum level of sill that you can achieve is defined by the minimum SC. So when you have an SC of one, you can achieve a maximum seal one with that. When you have an SC of two, the maximum seal that you can achieve is seal two, no matter what redundancy configuration you will have. So that is here your leading indicator here for your maximum seal is also now here the systematic capability. And systematic capability to keep it simple in the explanation is a kind of a quality measurement on the hardware and on the software design quality or the rigorous of design of your software and hardware based on the definition of part two and part three of the 659. And you need to have a safety manual per device that's a mandatory requirement. Some challenges for you, which is out there in the field, which I'm very well aware of. If you look on the left-hand side for the prior use for the manufacturer, sorry, excuse me, for the operating and for the end users, well, the, the challenge is always that the uh, end users, they don't really keep a clear record of quality fair feedback data. So the majority of all the clients we work for have no own data. So they have to rely on to some generic databases that they have to either purchase or maybe get through the manufacturers, etc. And the second bullet here, which will be a challenge for the operating companies, is the installations today. They all are based on, let's say, firmware, where it is about the type B installation. And I'm talking typically about your sensors. And you cannot buy any smart or hard transmitter without firmware. But think about how many installations have the same firmware revisions. And when it comes to proven use, how many manufacturers receive good feel, uh, uh, failure feedback. That means the manufacturers often do not receive any feedback unless maybe the equipment is really of high, uh, let's say, volume of investment. And there the manufacturer may have some good data for. Some recommendations, start collecting data. It's since the edition two of 2016, so it's now five years that for the end users, the SIG 1511 is saying, collect your quality data yourself, because that is the essence to prove that you have got some good data yourself in able to uh, prove your proven in use or your prior in use. So prior use is for the end users operating company, but for the proven in use, give the feedback back to the manufacturers. Redefine your proof test coverage. It's not just a theoretical number on paper equal to 90%. Prove that how we have come to that number and try to see how we can prove your consistency. That's also based on the data requirements for the edition two of the 61511. Provide the valuable feedback to the manufacturer. So please provide feedback to the manufacturers, especially when a device is not in warranty anymore or any longer. And when using Road 1H, evaluate the safety manual. Read and understand the safety manuals that the manufacturers mandatory have to provide to you. And when using Road 2H, meaning that when your uh, vendor is giving you a Road 2H definition, Ask him to compare your environment and your application to what they prove 
in their proven in use. As Mauro was saying, GMI is not only a uh, provider of equipment. We also provide with services with some consultancies into projects. So for the 6511, we have all this lifecycle support. And as Mauro was saying, we have something new in our service portfolio, which is called the lifecycle support for the 62443, which is known in the uh, industry for the cyber security. So we do security management and assessments on industrial installations. Plus also we help some uh, supplier security uh, management to prove the uh, security level on their equipment. We can support you with the TUV Rhineland competency reviews, mainly on the functional safety, which is, as Mauro was mentioning, in the older days before COVID, we were doing a large number over a year. Now we do majority is all virtually. We just delivered the training course for the US uh, North America time region. We are now planning, if I remember next month, we are doing the Asia time region and also the European time region with a virtual training course on functional safety. We also provide the same on cybersecurity. So we have here the cybersecurity, the fundamental course, which is a three and a half days course. And we also provide the security risk assessment, which is another three and a half day course. All those courses here are all monitored and all be accredited by the TLV Rhineland Committee. And that is where you will get on your personal name a certification. Plus, we also provide customized in-house trainings for uh, functional safety and we have the GMI webinars. We support with the, with the manual for SIL, that's the Safety Instrument System Edition 4. And I think, Maro, I can give the word back to you. I will stop it here and then you can take over. Yeah, I take over and we have, uh, um, I will be sharing uh, another short presentation. It's just a few pages. Uh, it's uh, where we have collected uh, uh, some question uh, collected during the registration phase and we are going to provide you answer. Uh, if I'm able to take yeah, the control of the uh, of the screen. Yeah, now I'm able to, to, to get the control. So we will have four quest, five questions for you, uh, or better. We have five questions received from you and we will provide you answer. So we can start with the first one, Dino. Uh, I leave you reading that because uh, I don't want to mix up uh, and to create confusion. Okay. So since the quality feather data, which is the key issue on the edition two of the IEC 6511. Now the question came from a engineer who is based in the United Kingdom. So the BS, which is standing here in front of this, I don't know if you can see my cursor moving, that means the British standard European norm 6511 um, in appropriate detail. So I will cover this close, Maro, if you can give me the next slide. So what is the standard saying? The reliability data used when quantifying the effect of a random feather shall be credible, shall be traceable, shall be documented, and shall be justified it, and shall be based on field feedback from similar devices used in a similar operating environment. The question is, how do you do that? Where do you start? And when do you judge when something is quality or not? And because of the nature of the question that came out of the United Kingdom, I also base my answer, which is coming from a public domain data, which is here shown as HSE, stands for the Health and Safety Executive. That's an organization in the United Kingdom. And they have a link, a web link, which I have shown over here on the bottom. Now, when I checked yesterday uh, morning or yesterday afternoon, to uh, check the validity of the web link. Yesterday, they had some maintenance going on. This morning, I didn't check the web, web link yet, but if the web link would work again, that is here, the web communities from the HAC, and I have given you here the picture of the data that you should see if the link is working again, and it giving you guidance to do documents. And one guidance is here, the demonstration for prior use, 
which is a very valid document. And as you can see, it's very newly updated, released again in February 2021. So anyone that struggled to understand how to collect data, I would say go to this document. And the second one is demonstration prior use. It's a second document. It's a little bit older. This is from May 2018, but it's still a very good document, which I would highly recommend to read this. Yes, Maro. So second question. Is there any standard or TR stands for technical report or any regulated guidelines that confirm what are the minimum specific checklist to consider the the uh, the uh, data for to be considered to be proven in use is model um i was not sure on the question itself that that came in in our registration questionnaire i was not sure if that engineer because they were talking in the beginning about prior use but then stop it to proven use so i told enable to answer both because i was assuming it was prior use but then i was thinking maybe uh, the en engineer assumed uh, proven use. It's clear you cannot just say that based on maybe my field feedback, the quality is good or not. There are guidance in the industry giving. And I have to say my, my personal uh, interpretation, I'm still waiting eager until the release will be out for the technical report number four, which will be out 2021. That's what I hope. Okay, because the edition one from the standard 6, 15, 11, that's what technical report four was written on. That's still the old 2015. I can tell you, I have seen the draft for the edition two report four. There are a lot of items changed, especially in the context for the proven, in, sorry, for the prior use. The Namur is a very solid document which has been out for many years. It's still a good document. And there is this third document, which I just referred to coming from the HSC from the web committees, which is the newest one. There's no doubt that this is the newest one. And I can tell you all those, uh, let's say, uh, industry effort is also learning from history. So they also try to guide the engineers in the field what should be collected. That would be my three references here for prior use. For proving use for the manufacturers, those are two very solid standards and reference documents that needs to be uh, proven if it comes to quality. Yes, Maro. Here again. Ah. How does proven in use and prior use reflect on sales certificate and safety manual? Okay, Maro. Um, let me think about again. PIU stands for proven in use, prior use versus certificate slash safety manual. Oh yeah. The question was from someone who registered, how do we see on our certificate if it is prior in use or proven in use? Sorry, prior use or proven in use? Logically, as I put between brackets, proven in use, row 2H, based on an IEC 61508, can be reflected on the certificate and assessed by the accreditation company. What they will typically do is additional investigation are typically also launched because the accreditation office putting their name and logo on a piece of paper also has a certain credibility in the industry. And they will not just say, based on the data, it looks good. They will may want to do some additional investigation. And those are typically additional tests before making the expert judgment before they will actually allow to be called SIL X for a certain road to age investigation. Bullet number two, it would be a challenge to add prior use. I'm thinking loud now. I personally, it would be very hard for any accreditation or any expert judgment to put a certification piece of paper out on a equipment feedback failure data for the operating companies because it would mean that quality data feedback from similar profiles from an end user slash operating company needs to be analyzed. And as we all know, the lack of data, quality data is typically always failing with an end user or an operating company. So it would be very hard that they would collect data with the install based and put this on their own certificate for a manufacturer. That's my own personal 
opinion. So I personally would say very hard to believe that it would be possible to do. Yes, Maro. Last question. Or Last question. question. There are two questions here. Can a mechanical partial stroke meet the proven in use? Actually, I was looking in the name of participants and I, and I personally believe the person who posted this question did not even log in to the webinar. But anyhow, I just have the pleasure to read the question again. Can a mechanical partial stroke meet proven in use requirements? That's the first question. Second, can a mechanical partial stroke be certified as SIL3 capable? Yes, Maro. First question, can a mechanical partial stroke meet proven in use requirements? Short answer is yes. Without smiling, I'm trying to be serious now. Uh, the question is, what is proven? What is proven when you have a partial stroke needs to be proven in use? And it is possible. Clearly, without opening the Pandora box here, the short answer is yes. And since the person, I don't recognize him, and if he is online, you can put a new question in the Q&A box, then we will see that you are still alert. But I don't think he is online, so we can skip that. But the second one, and I would have a great pleasure to discuss that with this person, can a mechanical partial stroke be certified as SIL3 capable? And my neutral answer, everything is possible nowadays on paper. In other words, you can certify anything on, on, on paper, everything can be SIL3 capable. The question is, and now we have to think about that. And let's, let's make it pretty simple. You have a valve, mechanical valve on a pipeline. And you put a mechanical valve and let's take a ball valve for those who are mechanically, let's say, uh, capable to understand this. You have a ball valve that is moving inside a pipeline. And you put a partial stroke on there maybe of 20, let's say 30%. And a partial stroke of 30%, you do this maybe every six months and every six months, that ball valve is very nicely actually reacting on the stroke of the valve and it's always moving in your 30% range. And you can already imagine that if you do this for years and years and years, your mechanical wear out most likely, of course, very logically, will be in this 30% range. And one day you want to close the valve 100%. And the ball valve is moving very happily in the 30% range, as we told you before. But after 30%, all of a sudden, it wants to close the valve totally. Where do you think is the likelihood the valve will not be likely moved totally to the closed position is in the partial stroke where it has never stroke before? Those are simple things to explain. Okay. Now, to keep it very simple, I'm saying here the following sense. As the COVID-19 worldwide situation in some parts of the world is starting to be a little bit relaxed, they even start to talk about that, again, people will be allowed to go on holiday, to take an aircraft to go from A to B. Imagine that you book a holiday trip with your family. And you board your aircraft, and I will not mention the airline name here, but you board the aircraft. And the pilot welcomes you personally with his certificate when you board the aircraft, said, look, my plane and myself, my competency, and all my co-pilot here in front of the cockpit, we are all certified to operate the aircraft, and we have good news for you. We are certified on paper to descend the aircraft between 30,000 to 35,000 feet up and down. We are certified for that. That's your partial stroke. But we cannot prove that we ever landed the aircraft. We cannot prove we ever did it safely. Question is, would you and your good family go on board? Said, oh, it's fine. The aircraft will be fine. I will be able to land. I can tell you that this is a simple example what partial stroke does for you. They prove to you, they do something, but they don't prove anything they will be able to go to safety when you will need it. The question is, will you trust this to prove on your safety valve you can close when you will need it under process conditions? That is the other dilemma that many people can only prove during a shutdown. 
They are allowed to prove that the valve closes under shutdown, which is not, not under the conditions of the process. Anyhow, as the guy that asked, or the engineer that posted the question is most likely not online. That's why there is no new question coming in. So I think you have enough evidence here or enough food to tote. Think about when it comes to proven in use or even prior in use, what would you trust to be safe or not? Yes, Maro, we can close this, I think. Yes, in fact, we have the very last question uh, for them, for the participant, uh, and uh, we would like to, to get your feedback uh, on, on, on our job, mainly Pinos. Uh, we would like to, um, to, to check with you how was the presentation for you? In the meantime, uh, I take the chance to remind you that uh, you can watch again uh, this, uh, this presentation as well as uh, uh, all the other webinar uh, at our YouTube uh, channel. You will get a copy of the presentation and uh, I kindly and strongly invite you to check on our web uh, which are the next uh, possibility, the next webinars with the new, with the, with the other topics, functional safety, intrinsic safety, cybersecurity, or application, uh, as well as to visit our website to check out uh, uh, which are the next possibility for trainings. Uh, as Tino was mentioning, uh, we have uh, at the moment uh, a training program for the functional safety, for the cybersecurity, it's a program with uh, with uh, certification uh, scheme, and uh, that's all. For the rest, uh, on on the on the presentation, you will get uh, you will have also our um, contacts. So if you need further information, you can just drop us an email and uh, we will try to satisfy and to reply to you. In the meantime, I have to close this uh, uh, pool and show the result. Uh, so thank you very much for participating. Thank you very much for your feedback. Thank, thanks, Tino, for sharing your deep knowledge with, uh, with us, with GMI and uh, with, uh, with, uh, with our customers. And uh, see you next time. Thank you, Maru. Keep it safe, everyone, and see you on the next webinar somewhere.